Hello lovelies. In this video we're going to be looking at one of the practicals that you need to do if you're at A-level biology. So in this video we're going to be doing choice chambers, we're going to be using wood lice, we're going to be looking at what they do in different situations and where they go and then we're going to be doing some analysis of the data and then we can use this to look at the sort of different exam questions they can ask you and how you can approach these exam questions, how we can change practical, how we can improve the practical. There's lots of things in this video so let's get going. Hi everyone. Okay, so we are going to look at one of the practicals that is done at A level that looks at animal behaviour. It's really one of the only practicals in this kind of nervous control response topic um, where we kind of look at the responses of organisms. And most of the time, you're going to be looking at the responses of invertebrates, so things like maggots or wood lice or flatworms, um, especially in the exam questions you're going to get asked as well. And part of that reason is because obviously they are less bound by ethical rules for keeping them, maintaining them, looking after them, harming them. Uh, so they are easier to use for these types of experiments, especially in schools. OK, so what we're going to look at an example is looking at taxes in wood lice by putting them into a choice chamber or a choice chamber like setup where they're going to have different conditions and they'll be monitoring their movement. And in theory, if they are going to be moving towards or away from a stimulus like we've talked about, then we will, should be able to predict where they're going to end up, what conditions they would prefer. And that would suggest that they are able to sense those conditions and then move accordingly. So we've got an equipment list here. So a large glass dish with a lid or a choice chamber, something that you can put them in in order to be able to observe them. Black paper or tin foil in order to create a dark environment, your wood lice. Something to create a dry environment, something to create a wet environment, so the silica gel or some form of deoxidizer, wet cotton wool or paper towel, and then a plastic spoon or a paintbrush, and that's in order to hand or manipulate the wood lice so that you're not using your hands. So we're going to set up the choice chamber. So we're going to have two halves, light and dark, and then within those two halves, we can also add a uh, wet and dry environment. So we can have four different environments in total, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Then we've got 10 organisms. In our case, we're using wood lice, and I think we're going to use slightly less than 10 because I wasn't able to get 10. Uh, put them in the centre and then leave them for 10 minutes and then record how many wood lice are in each half at the end of 10 minutes or in each section, actually, that should say. And then repeat and take a mean. Obviously, we're always going to repeat this, especially with um, animal behaviour experiments or something where you're relying on organisms to do something. The more repeats you can do, in the better because they're not always going to behave in totally expected ways. Risks for this are mostly focused on the idea that we're using living organisms, in this case wood lice, so they technically are classed as a biohazard. Um, you could have an allergic reaction to them, they obviously can like cause bites or stings sometimes, wood lice no, but if depending on what organism you're using. And then we have also got responsibility to treat them humanely, so we need to return insects from outdoors as quickly as possible, make sure we're not keeping them, or if we are keeping them, we're making sure that they're in suitable conditions when they're not being used, treated humanely, and we minimise our handling. We're using plastic spoon or, or paintbrush to move them around, and if you do touch them or come into contact with them, then we need to make sure we wash our hands. All of those things are fairly easy and simple precautions to go through, but we need to make sure that we're showing respect for the animals and as well as being safe. So I have collected some wood lice from outside. It's very important that when you collect the wood lice that we're treating them humanely. So I've taken some bark and some leaves and some soil and put that in this little Tupperware that they can then hide and move around in and be kept in, in a cool dark place when you're not using them. Okay, so that is sort of what I did. I went outside, collected some wood lice, brought them back in a Tupperware, kept them in this nice, um, lovely environment and then was able to use numbers of those wood lice for the experiment each time, removed them from this habitat and then put them back when they weren't being used. OK, so our method, like it said, it was to set up this choice chamber. Mine is not a specifically custom made choice chamber. Um, I made it using basically a big Petri dish. Um, and so we, I'll explain how I made the different environment sections. 
Okay, so I am making up my little choice chamber here. Um, I've got four quadrants, and that'll make more sense once I put the lid on in a second. But you can see we've got dry here and dry here. This will be dry in the dark because when I put the lid on, this is covered by the dark green paper. And then I've got the light square here as well. And you can see around the edge of these dry sections, I've put some of that it's activated charcoal. It comes in those little sachets and things that need to be kept dry. And then in these two, I've put some kitchen towel and I've just made them wet with some kitchen towel. So it's going to be a damp environment. And again, I've got uh, dark this side and light this side. So I'm just going to put the lid on to show you for now, but in a second we are going to have to make a little layer in between. But when the lid goes on, you're going to be able to see that we then have, so we then have our dark section over here covered, and then we have our two light sections over here that the light will pass through. So what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to put a thin layer of cloth inside the choice chamber for the wood lice to walk on top of. So they, they're they not actively walking on the charcoal or walking on the wet areas. They're walking on the top and it's just about the kind of moisture coming through from underneath or the dry area or the light and the dark. They can then move around freely across all four sections and choose where they want to go. Okay, so I've placed my cloth in and you can see, hopefully, if I spin it down, that there's actually now a gap. So there's a gap between the cloth and the lid. So there's enough space there for them to walk around on. But crucially, my kind of surface isn't touching the wet and so it's not going to absorb that water um, but it's going to be near enough to it that they'll be able to sense the humid environment versus the dry environment and then we can see my lines on here and what we'll do is I'll put the wood lice in the center and then put the lid on leave it recording and, and watch what happens and time it and then once we've had them going for a set amount of time we will check to see how many are in each quadrant and record the number Okay, so I have my eight wood lice. Um, I've just tipped them into a small vessel so I can tip them all into the middle in one go. And then I'm going to quickly put the lid on because they will run very fast. And there should be eight. And I'm going to tip them straight into the middle. And then quickly put the lid on and make sure the conditions are the right way around so that we have the dark outside. So now we're going to set the timer for 10 minutes and see what happens. So you can see here that obviously they're moving around um, up and down and they continue to move for uh, most of the time that we were recording. Um, and obviously, although this seem random, this movement seems random, it's idea is that in theory by the end of the 10 minutes they'll have sort of got used to that environment and then they will have moved towards or away from a stimulus so you can see that there's actually very few of them in the light section uh, as we're sort of filming and recording okay so that's me taking off the lid at the end so we can literally see which wood lice are in each quadrant at this point in time and you can see here and this will be important in a minute when we look at the results is that there's actually there are two in this quadrant in the picture that I'm going to show you that I took at the end of the freeze frame, this one had walked into this section. But at the end of the 10 minutes when I took the lid off, this one was actually in this section and this one was also here. OK, so it's about recording and making sure that you kind of if you record it and film it at this time then you can kind of be accurate um, because obviously with the black covering, it's kind of hard to tell um, who is in the black sections. So um, this is a good way of doing it and sort of filming it or taking a picture straight away, having a, someone else to help you to make sure that you can know they're not always going to stop moving. And this is one of the um, perils of working with moving organisms. I used eight wood lice. And the reason for that makes sense in a minute, because we're going to end up doing a chi-squared test on this data. So realistically, it would be good to have an even number that is divisible by four so that you can have an expected equal number in each quadrant. This does come with its own challenges. So in theory, chi-squared works best when the expected numbers are greater than five. The problem with that is that would mean I would need 20 wood lice and I couldn't get 20 wood lice. And also 20 wood lice in this small um, chain would have been quite difficult. So I went with eight, which was closest to 10. Um, that does mean that our chi-squared is not going to be super reliable. 
um, because it's not following the exact the conditions that are required for the test. But that's OK. It's more about knowing that you should do that test and how to carry it out or how to interpret the results than it is making sure that you do it accurately in terms of your data. It's more important to take care of the wood lice humanely, run the experiment correctly, understand um, what you're expected to um, see and why. OK, so recording the results. You had been recording results ideally in a table as you went along with each repeat that you did. Um, I filmed and did all the repeats and took screen grabs or um, took photos at the end in order to then fill in my results table. So these are my kind of final shots when the lid was lifted after 10 minutes for my four repeats. And then I'm just going to take those numbers and put them into the table. So I've got remembering, so the shots are this way around, so the same way as I filmed the setup. So we've got dark, dry, dark, damp at the top, light, dry, and then light, damp at the bottom. So I just need to count the number of wood lice in each section and then put that into the table. So there is one in the top left, zero in the bottom left, three in the bottom right, and four in the top right. There is a fourth one that ran off to the side in the top right that you can't see from this image, but it is present in the video. So I'm just going to put those numbers into my table and then do exactly the same for the other three repeats. So this is the one where I said that was in the video that you saw of me carrying out the experiment. So that one had actually walked across. So there was two in that light damp quadrant. OK, so we've filled in our table now, we need to work out the averages. So work out the averages in the normal way. But we are going to have to round them up to whole numbers. Remember, this is going to be categoric data. You can't have 0.25 of a wood lice. So and obviously they need to add up to eight because that's how many we have. So 2.25 becomes two, 3.5 becomes four. We don't have a pickle here because we have 0 0.5 and then we have 1.75. 1.75 obviously needs to be rounded up to 2, and that makes more sense looking at that data. 0 0.5 therefore needs to go back down to 0 so that we have 8 in total. So it's a little bit um, difficult here with kind of thinking about rounding, but you have to have whole numbers. You can't have decimals for this because you can't have part of a wood lice, and it will not work for the chi-squared if we don't do it that way. This could be a justification for using the median value rather than the mean, for example, um, because then you wouldn't necessarily get a, um, a decimal place or the mode. Um, but you would need to have a look at your data, maybe work out all of those options and see which one best fits the data. I think this makes sense. Looking 2402 fits the pattern we've got in the data about right. I would say potentially if we did the modal number or for example, that would be two for dark damp, and that's not really appropriate. Um, and if we did the modal number, because we've got four repeats, that would be difficult finding the middle. We'd have to split it each time into two, and then we would get a decimal. So it would be one of those things you'd have to work out, and you'd still have to round up. OK, so we've got our results. So we move on to the analysis. I've drawn a really simple bar graph to help us kind of visualise our results. And the null hypothesis for this investigation would be that there'd be no difference in the number of wood lice in each section after 10 minutes. It's, and that's that would be so null hypothesis is always that there is no difference or no change or no relationship. So, however, obviously, we can see that there is a slight difference. And this is expected because we know from taxes behavior and what wood lice environments they prefer they're going to hopefully directionally move away from light. So demonstrate negative phototaxis because they prefer dark, damp, cool environments. So anything that's light and dry, they are going to want to move away from and they will demonstrate that behaviour. It's also likely that the wood lice are going to slow down or spend more time in the damp areas as dry environments, they're more prone to water loss. Um, they obviously have hard exoskeletons and they need to be able to respire through spiracles. And so when they open those, they do not want to lose water. So if they're in a dry environment, that risks losing water. So they would spend more time in human environments. So being able to sense their environment and we expect them to move to where they will be more comfortable or demonstrate negative phototaxis away from light 
again, because it could be due to predation, but also because it means that they would end up in their favourable environment of being dark. So in order to test to see if these differences are significant, we need to do a statistical test. We can't just hand on heart say, OK, yeah, look, more wood lice went to the dark and damp and therefore they were demonstrating phototax negative phototaxis and they spent more time in the damp than in the dry. And so therefore that demonstrates and proves our hypothesis. We can't say that this data backs up that suggestion unless we do a kind of squared test in order to prove it. And we're doing a chi squared test because we have categorical data. They were either in a section or not. There was no in between. OK, so we're going to calculate chi squared for our data because we haven't got a lot and it's quite simple to do. So the equation is chi squared equals the sum of the observed minus the expected value squared divided by the expected. So our expected, as we said, would be two in each. So there'll be no difference between the number of wood lice in each of the four environments. That would be two, 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 two. Then we put in our observed data, which was two, four, zero, two. Then we take them away, which we get zero, two, two, and zero, because remember we're doing observed minus expected. So that would be minus two, which is fine, because then we're going to square the values and this is often done in statistical tests because they understand there will be minus values and it's just done basically to get rid of the minus values. Then we're dividing them by expected, which is going to get, take us back down to two. Zero, two, two, zero. Then we need to just sum that together. So add up the two twos, which gives us four. So our chi squared value is four. That's our calculated value for chi squared. So. If the calculated value for chi squared is greater than or equal to the critical value that's found in the table, then we can reject the null hypothesis because there's less than 5% probability that the difference between the observed and the expected values are due to chance. OK, so this is the type of language you need to use in the exam if you are explaining how to work out chi squared or what how to say what your result is. And you may be given a probability table that looks something like this and be required to look up the critical value to see if uh, the result is significant or not. So the first thing we need to know is the degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is always n minus one or the number of conditions minus one. So in this case, we had four conditions. So n minus one is three. So we need to be looking at row three of the table, which is where we're going to find our critical value. And for our experiment and all science experiments, really, we need to be at the minimum looking at the 0.05 level. So that is you might have heard this as like the probability is 0.05. That means less than 5% chance probability that the difference is due to chance. So that's why we're looking there. The 0.01 level is less than, not point, uh, less than one chance probability, which is even higher. So sometimes it does come under that, but most likely we're just focusing on degrees of freedom at three and 0 0.05. You might also get given a p-value. Now we aren't calculating a p-value here, but if you used um, a statistical calculator or a program to do it, they are able to give you the p-value. So this works slightly differently. So the p-value for this test is 0.2615. So that means it's not less than 0.05. So we accept the null hypothesis. And this is the same as doing the critical value. So if we look at the critical value. So 4 here, so the calculated value for chi-squared is less than the critical value for 0.05 for 3 degrees of freedom because that's 7.815. So we have to accept the null hypothesis. We accept that there's more than 5% probability that the difference between the observed and the expected values is due to chance. So with this result, we have to say that there's no significant difference between the observed and the expected number of wood lice in each environment here. But again, like I said, this chi-squared isn't entirely robust because we've got a zero value, for example. So there was no observed um, wood lice in the light dry environment and our expected values are less than five. So we are not working in the realms of how chi-squared is supposed to be applied. So although we saw the differences and this says that they're not significant, 
for us in this data set, the chi-square test is not super um, reliable. And just a reminder for students doing AQA, you do not need to do the calculation of chi-squared in the exam. You will not be expected to calculate any statistical test values in the exam. You just need to be able to interpret the value. So if you're given a critical value and a table, you need to be able to say whether it's higher or lower and whether that means it's significant or not. Or if you're given a p-value, and then you need to be able to say whether it is significant or not. OK, so there's two different um, things at play here. Either if you've got the critical, uh, the calculated value and you have to look up the critical value, then you're looking for your calculated value to be greater than or equal to that number. Or if you're given the p-value, you're looking for your p-value to be less than 0.05 or even less or less than 0.01, etc. in order for it to be significant. OK, so that is the summary of how to do the animal behaviour practical with wood lice, uh, and how to look and analyse your results and calculate the chi-squared value. Hope that was helpful. And the next practical in this series is going to be looking at blood glucose in urine. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.